I consider property management the real estate cheat code. What do you think about that? <laughs> I can see that, right? Like, I can see why you say that. Because it is. Uh, <laughs> right? Because it, it is. It surely is, right? Like, because we are, we get, all, we get to see all of it. And this is how I started investing, right? So I started investing by managing my godfather's properties. My godfather had land, he had development, he had all these. And I was just learning. I didn't even know about investing, really. I didn't know about investing. I knew you manage a property, you collect rent, you do these things. And little by little, I'm like, oh, man, this is the return he's getting. This is what he, I started, you know, Google. I'm, I'm, I did graduate from Google University, right? Like, so I'm Googling <laughs> all the stuff I need to know about property management. And I was able to see how you handle maintenance. I was able to see how you handle a rental, how you how you look at a budget, all these things that I started learning. Learned about like cash on cash, all these different things that you you get to learn by managing people's properties, right? And and, and then that's why I, why I feel like it's a cheat code for me, right? Because now I got the game. Like they come to me and they're like, Sterling, I'm doing this, this, and this. Uh, I'm going to buy 100 rental properties. This is how I'm doing it. Like, people just give me the game. Like, I'm like, oh, cool. All right, taking that. I'm going to go buy 100 rental properties just like he bought 100, right? And that's basically how I started investing too, right? Like, I just took what I was learning through property management and how these all these people was doing different things. And I learned what not to do, right? Mm. I learned, <laughs> whoa, whoa, that person over leveraged himself, right? Like, he did the burr. But he took out too much money in the wrong neighborhood. I'm not going to do that either, right? So it, it, it truly allowed me to see so many aspects of real estate that I, I feel like it's a cheat code. But it also uh, <laughs> is is a uh, unique uh, it's a unique business to be in. Let me let me say that. What's your biggest challenge as a property manager? Um, I, I, our biggest bottleneck inside property management is is previous property management. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is what we're trying to do. So I'm not a property manager, right? Uh, I never have done property management up until I started Ethosity Property Management. So for me, what it allowed me to look at it is as an entrepreneur. Any entrepreneur, you have a profit and you have a loss, right? Correct. Inside property management, if you go to a property management conference tomorrow, the number one question that they everybody asks you is, you know what it is? You probably don't. I don't. The number one question is, how many doors do you have? Mm. Right? I knew that. Yeah, yeah. I don't think you do. <laughs> like, they ask you how many doors you have. As an entrepreneur, you know this. That means nothing. Right? Sure. That absolutely means nothing. Because you can have a thousand doors and not have a pot to piss in. Mm. And so for, for me, I started looking at this holistically of how an entrepreneur should look at it. So I said, some of these rules that you have been living by is completely BS, right? Like it's completely uh, stupid, <laughs> like, you know what I mean? And the challenge, the biggest challenge has been the idea that it's changing a culture, right? It's changing the idea that a percentage model based um, fee structure is is good, right? Normal property management says your rent, whatever your rent is, charge ten percent of it, right? Right. But why does that make sense? In in other businesses, your Big Mac does not cost more because you get it from Thirty Eighth Street than you get it on One Hundred Sixteenth Street. Right. Right. So why do we do this inside of property management? And that's what I started challenging. I started challenging the idea of this norm because in my property management, you either have people that died after three to four years in property management or people that's been here for 50, right? right? So it was never like in between there. So the biggest challenge has been changing a culture that doesn't help the investor that's investing that you're managing a property, nor does it help the business. So most investors would tell you, property manager, my property manager sucks. The communication sucks. Everything about it sucks. Most people understand that about property management. But they don't understand or want to change property management for the better. Mm. Because, so it's that culture that says, yeah, they suck. 
but I don't want to pay anymore because this is the model in which we've been we've been doing this. So every day, that's what we fight. Every day, it's we're improving. When technology improves, we improve. With with the culture, you know, just different demographics change, we're we're changing. But it, it still gets bumped up against because we're like, well, we're going to charge you for every fee. Every, we're going to charge you for the services that we render, just like any other business. And people are like, what? No, I just I want the percentage model. And what I tell them is, think about this. It's it's kind of like property management before I got into this was a loss leader. Most people stock them deep and sell them cheap, right? Mm -hmm. When I get to a hundred doors, I'm going to be profitable. I get to a thousand doors, that's when I'm really going to start making money and I can start hiring people. Well, what happens is, it's this a projection of, all right, I'm going, but you know, any business, you grow, what do you need to do? Add more resources to it. Right. So that profitability in that dream shrinks, cool. never happens, right? Same thing. 300 doors, 500 doors, it shrinks, it shrinks, it shrinks. So as we started changing this, this culture... People are like, I like it, I like what you're doing, but I don't want to pay more for it. And I argue, you're already paying more for it, you just don't know it. For those that are new to real estate, mm -hmm. um, what do you see You know that th those new members gain when they, when they yeah. get there? Yeah, I think it's huge. I, I really do think, I, I think... Syria in itself, in its essence of what we do for new investors is really dope because there's a safe place, right? Like mm. it, it's sometimes hard going in, like where we met, right? We went to Finance of America. It's so all these people that's been in doing this for umpteen years and they talk in, you know, industry terms and you're like, but if I was new, I would be kind of lost. Mm. Like, you know, I would be kind of, I'm like, man, this, this is great drinks and food, but, uh, what y'all talking, talking about? What y'all talking about? Like, right, like you right. know, so I think Syria is good for that, right? Like, I think it was great for, even for myself, right? To really learn um, in a safe environment where people wasn't judging me, right? Um, I think that's where we really have have hit the nail on the head, right? I, I think, you know, when I look at Syria's, like, projection, right? Syria's actually been around since, like, 1980, Started as the Landlord Association. Um, and then the Landlord Association kind of, they only wanted to talk about was landlord and stuff. Like, But you realize, you know, investing is more than just landlording, right? Um, and then that's, that changed over to Syria. Um, they wasn't making money. Um, and then we came in and now we're profitable. Had to go to a, from a nonprofit to a for-profit. That was a bump in the road. But now it's it's thriving. Like we're we're doing really really well um, inside of what it does for you know new investors is is insane. I think I think it's one of the best resources that you can invest in for less than three hundred dollars a year. Can you talk about the power of proximity and some of the dope people that you met? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I think I think you know it's it's one of those things that uh, when I first got to Syria. Uh, you know, was the idea that I just wanted to be, Vicky asked me, she said, what do you want to do? I said, I just want to be available, mm. right? I want to be available for whatever God has for me, right? Like I want to, if you introduce me, I'm available. If you, in, you know, want me to go, I'm available, right? So when I started just being available, I started sitting in rooms with people that's been doing it. I, I, I joke with uh, this dude, Dave Short, right? Dave Short, I joke because he's like 192 years old, right? Like he he, <laughs> he was flipping houses with Moses, like you know, like Dave was up in here, like listen, that's a nice boat. All right, I get it. Like we got to build it, and they were come, like right, that's like, funny. But, so he's seen like real estate transition. He always tells me, Sterling, every 10 years you got to reinvent yourself, right? Like mm. so he's seen real estate every 10 years kind of make this shift. I mean, he's been doing it for 275 years. So I mean, like, he has to be able to know what's going on. So being able to be in rooms with people like that is amazing. He flips like 10 to 15 homes a month. Wow. Right? And, and you know, I told somebody yesterday, I was like, man, I think what Syria changed for me as a little black boy was, 
was I, it was almost like I found out Santa Claus wasn't real. I did explain right. that. <laughs> so look, 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 right? So when I first got into sorry, I'm, it's cool. I'm it's the mic. Up. It's cool. uh, when I first got into Syria, I thought people bought real estate because they were rich. Mm. Right? And then this dude that was working with me doing this, he had 60 units we were managing, right? He had 60 units he was managing. And Dave was flipping 10 to 15 properties a month. And one day we were talking, they said, man, you know what? Uh, I'm gonna talk to my, 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 my private lender. And then the other guy said, well, you know, my first 50, I, I didn't put any money into it. And I'm sitting there like, Santa Claus is not real. Like, you know, like, like the idea that like how I thought wealth in investing worked is not how really it worked. Like all these dudes is making a ton of money with no money in the deals and no money like really out. out. And I was like, wait a minute, nobody told me this? Like, like Santa Claus is not real. Like this, you've been lying to me. Mm. I've been waking up every Christmas morning <laughs> thinking that somebody was coming down my chimney. I should have known when I don't even have a chimney that, that Santa Claus wasn't real. But that so, so for right. me, it was that was the 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 aha moment mm. was being in you know these rooms with people and they start telling you like, nah, I brought this flip. Yeah, dude gave me eight percent with one point. All I had to do was pay that point, and I got that flip money. What? Are you kidding me? Mm. I do whatever the deal tells me to do. Smart man. Right? So I don't look at investing in the sense of like going in like I only buy and hold. Because I feel like you will lose opportunities because you're so rigid. Right? So I, I, I flip, I guess. I kind of wholesale a little bit. I do regular brokerage. Every deal is a different deal for me. Uh, I buy and hold. The ultimate goal, though, is to buy and hold. Right? Like that's my ultimate goal. But... Every deal is not meant to be held. Got you, got you. Why is your ultimate goal to buy and hold? Because I think that is what real estate is meant to be used for. I think real estate is meant to be leveraged and it's meant to be a vehicle in which we hold it inside for different reasons, tax benefits and and just the appreciation. And, 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 you know, so that's my ultimate goal is to hold real estate, right? Um, now I think you know as I, I mature and things I realize there's some other alternatives and things, but I love what real estate does when you hold it. But like I said, that does not mean that every deal that comes across my desk is meant to be held. But I don't, I'm I'm at a point where I believe every deal is meant to make money off of though. There, there right? you go. There you <laughs> like go. that's like I, I found that even if it's five hundred dollars, I can make money off of it. Mm. You know what I mean? Like mm. I'll take five hundred if I can move it quickly, right? I'll take a thousand if I can move it quickly. I so I, I really truly believe in leveraging everything that I do. My favorite houses are houses that are small, on a slab, on a crawl, um two ones, three ones. Um, you know, Eagle Dell type houses, right? Like those are used to be, those are my favorite. I love those type of houses. Um, my monthly cash flow, I, I like to be above 200 if I can, um, because everything has to go right. Um, I started, you know, 10, 12 years ago, uh, <laughs> and I started in these urban areas, right? And that's where I built my, what I call my renter center model of management. Right, so when I first bought my house, uh, houses there in very, I mean, they in the hood basically, right? Like they in the hood, um, and I was making, I was projected to make about two hundred and fifty to three hundred dollars on them, right? And that's not uncommon. It's not uncommon that you make a higher margin inside of the urban areas because you buy them cheap, but it's a risk and a reward, right? So I was making two fifty to three hundred on them, great properties. Um, in the sense I got them for what I, I had to, you know, put in what I had to put in. So every week it was something new. Mm. Every week it was a garbage disposal, screen door. Somebody stole my AC unit. So I said, wait, I can't keep doing it like this. Mm. So at the end of the year, tenants moved out. I said, 
what has to be inside these rental properties by law, <laughs> what has to be in these rental properties. And, and I started looking, I said, well, in these units, most of these don't even have AC. I was adding AC just as a benefit, but I started realizing the standard for these neighborhoods at $600 in rent is they don't even come with ACs. I said, bro, they would be burning up today. Oh, boy. <laughs> so, so I garbage disposals. I had three garbage disposals go out in the first week of buying one of my properties at wow. the time. Screen doors, stove, refrigerators, all these things I was adding to the properties that was not necessary. So I said, look, told my contractor, take all that stuff out. Screen doors, all that. Take it all out. And I said, listen, why I call it the renter center model of management, right? It's because I give them... The standard never changes. Still give great flooring, still give great painting, kitchen, all that is still the standard in which that we, we don't go below the standard. But what we did was we said, all right, you want a stove and refrigerator? Bet. I got you. You know how you rented your TV, your couch, your everything, right? You can rent this stove and refrigerator from me for $30 deposit, I mean non-refundable deposit, uh, and $30 a month, right? So that's what we started doing. We started renting it back. And I'll buy it on, like at the time, I was buying it from like Big John's and places like there for $100. So within a couple months, I made my money back. I added revenue on my, my rental that wasn't there. Uh, and it, it worked. And also, we gave them the option that you, do, you didn't have to rent from us if you don't want it. But if you were to rent from us, these are the standards. So what happened after we, we gave them that option? People started saying, I don't want your stove and refrigerator. Okay, bet. It's your responsibility though, right? Mm -hmm. So when we didn't make that extra cash flow, we end up making the extra cash flow because we weren't responsible for it, right? So that that's how I look at just rental properties. Every rental segment from below 800 and below to 800 to 1,000, 1,000 above has a different style in which mm -hmm. I believe you you can do different things. Like 1,000 above, like you have to, you know, have some amenities and things like that. But there's certain fees and things that I can add that they don't even flinch at. Got you, got you. Now, somebody listening may say, man, $200 a month is not a lot. Yeah. Why would he invest in a property like that that only cash flows $200 a month? Yeah. So <laughs> there's there's a lot of reasons, right? One, because how much, it's not about how much, it is about that monthly, right? Like I love monthly cash flow, but you have to ask yourself, how much did you put in to get $200 a month, right? Like if I, if I told you, you can have $200 a month, but you paid $100,000 for it, you'd be like, nah, that's stupid. I ain't doing that deal. Like that don't make any sense. But if I told you, you can have $200 a month, and you initially put $10,000 down, and then after six months, you refinance that out, you make $50,000 plus that $200 a month, you would be like, and you, you make 50, and you make you know, 15 to 20% on that, on that 10,000, now you're like, all right, that's a good deal. I'll take, gotcha. I'll take $200 a month, right? Understood. And, as well as, I believe, like you know, when I first started, 200 wasn't anything. But then I got to 10 units and it was, you know, 1200 or, you know, it was mm. 22,000, it was 4,000, it was 5,000. Little by little that that 200 became worth it, right? Like it it's it's the it's the numbers game. So I, I always say like you can you can get the cash flow, that's part of it. The appreciation's another part of it. And of course, the equity in which you have inside the deal is is another leveraging point. But you have to ask yourself, how much did you put in to get two hundred dollars a month, right? Like, if I if I told you you can have two hundred dollars a month, but you paid a hundred thousand dollars for it, you'd be like, nah, that's stupid. I ain't doing that deal. Like, that don't make any sense. But if I told you you can have two hundred dollars a month, and you initially put ten thousand dollars down, and then after six months you refinance that out, you make fifty thousand dollars plus that two hundred dollars a month. You would be like, and you you make fifty, and you make you know, fifteen to twenty percent on that two on that ten thousand. Now you're like, 
all right, that's a good deal. I take gotcha. I take two hundred dollars a month, right? Understood. And uh, as well as uh, I believe, like you know, when I first started, two hundred wasn't anything. But then I got to ten units, and it was you know twelve hundred or you know it was mm. twenty two thousand. It was four thousand. It was five thousand. Little by little, that that two hundred became worth it, right? Like it it's it's the it's the numbers game. So I, I always say like you can you can get the cash flow. That's part of it. The appreciation is another part of it, and of course, the equity in which you have inside the deal is is another leveraging point. For me, life is too short. You know, we can we can act like we always have it together, right? Man. Like we can always put up this guru persona, right? Like for me, though, like I love being transparent. Um, so I feel like with inside transparency, you're able to learn, right? So if you can learn from me being a a whack drug dealer, or you can learn from me from being, you know, a terrible dad at one point where I left to follow my dreams, right? Like if you can learn uh, from me because of that, I, I'm able to be who I am today, right? Like, mm-hmm. and I provide for all my kids, right? Like the same mother too, like we married now, like, so it all worked out. But uh, I think if people can learn from, from that, uh, and, and if I can do it, then anybody can do it. Yeah.